I have prepared to teach, we will not have time to 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 do it all. Away that young man of charm that by Bagreen, no clong, yap it biting, I nick you, young man, pain, young, Bagreen, or day. You have some material. So, with your Bibles and that material, we'll be able to cover a great deal of, of, uh, of material. Okay, I want us to just take a brief overview of the Kingdom of God. And we will uh, focus on John chapter 18. Now, do you remember this story of how they took Jesus, the religious leaders had arrested Jesus, and then they took him to uh, the Roman ruler Pilate. They did not go into the headquarters of Pilate because that would make them ceremonially unclean. So Pilate went out to, to meet them. So he asked the people, what has this man done? They, they said he's a criminal. If, if, he, if he were not a criminal, we would not have brought him here to you. You see, if the Jews had killed Jesus, it would not have been by crucifixion. They accused Jesus of blasphemy. And the penalty for blasphemy would have been stoning the person to death. But the, but the Bible prophesied that Jesus would be crucified. And so they brought Jesus to the Romans did not they would did not know they were fulfilling prophecy. So the Romans were the ones who crucified Jesus. Now I want you to notice several things uh, that happened when Jesus was brought before Pilate. He asked Jesus, Are you a king? And you can see this in John chapter 18. And uh, in verse 33. Pilate said, are you the king? In the answer of Jesus, um, in, in our common day vernacular, he would say, you said it, you're right. Jesus said, I am a king. But I'm not the kind of king that you think I am. Jesus said, 
I, my, my kingdom is not of this world. So let's notice how Jesus himself defined his kingdom. Look in chapter 8, 18 of John, verse 36. He said, My kingdom is not of this world. Literally, my kingdom is not out of this world. The word means to, to put beside something and compare it to something else. Jesus said, you can't compare my kingdom with the world. So he was actually saying two things when he said, My kingdom is not of this world. He was, he was saying, First, my kingdom did not originate in this world. Uh, <coughs> 13 times Jesus uses this phrase of this world. Uh, Pilate, it's not what you think. You understand the kingdom to be something that you're over in a territorial sense. But my kingdom does not originate from this world. And uh, then he meant my kingdom is not the same as an earthly kingdom. My kingdom is unlike any kingdom on this earth. You see this meaning in John chapter 15 verse 19. Uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love you. But you're not of the world. I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Also in in First John chapter four verses five and six. John is is talking about false teachers. He said they are from the world. They speak from the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. So to be from the world means to be like the world. It means to act in such a way that the world approves of you. You must understand that the Bible teaches there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God which is the kingdom of righteousness. There is the kingdom of the world. 
which is over which Satan rules. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of light. The kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of darkness. So Jesus gives a specific example of how his kingdom is not like the world. Look at John chapter 18 verse 36. Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, then uh, my servants would have been fighting to protect me. But my kingdom does not come by the power of the sword. But by the power of the blood that Jesus is about to shed. Jesus conquers his enemies by the gospel, not by the sword. So his kingdom is not of this world. It's invisible and spiritual in nature. In Colossians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. Uh, the Bible says that we have been transferred from sorry, the sorry. kingdom Colossians Colossians, Colossians. Colossians. 1, 13, 14. yeah chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 he said we have been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God and he, we have been delivered, he said, delivered out of all of this darkness of the world, the evil of the world, in, into the light. And so this is the kind of Messiah, the kind of king that we follow. And that is that followers of Jesus Christ use spiritual weapons, not earthly weapons. And we go out to, to conquer the world, not with weapons of earthly warfare, but with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the kingdom of God is based upon our allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over again in the Bible, Jesus says that you must forsake everything else for me. Jesus said you have to deny yourself, your own ambitions, and be totally submitted to him. That Jesus comes before business. 
comes before family. He comes before your own ambitions. In those days, every Roman soldier took an oath of allegiance. The commander, uh, the Roman soldier. The Roman soldiers. It was called the sacramentum, this oath of allegiance, sacramentum. And, and the Roman soldier said he was completely under the authority of the general. Every action would be by the will of the general. And so it is with our allegiance to Jesus Christ. We are totally committed to him and, and we have no will but his will. In the kingdom of God, we are uh, exiles on this earth. In your uh, notes, I have several uh, several results of being uh, uh, passing through this earth as an exile. And first he says, you are a holy nation. I'm going to show you that from the very beginning of the Bible, God planned his kingdom. And he said, one word that characterizes the kingdom of God. And that is the word holy. holy. The word holy means different. It means set apart to be different. God has set his people apart from people of the world. And he says that, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1. In fact, let's look at this uh, in Ephesians chapter Chapter 1, he said, yeah. He says uh, that I have set you apart. Look in um, chapter 2 of Ephesians. And he says that once you were no people. And uh, you didn't know the truth. He says that uh, you were without God, without hope. But now 
you have been transferred out of all of that into the kingdom of God. Alright, let's notice these characteristics of people in the kingdom of God. First, as we've already said, we are transferred out of darkness into light. Your citizenship is in heaven. You are a citizen of uh, uh, this uh, nation on this earth, but you're also a citizen of the kingdom of God. And we are different from people of the world. And we are called into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. And we are God's chosen generation. And as I told you, the Bible says we are a holy people. When, when God called the people out of Egypt and delivered them from slavery, God said, I have made you to be different from the Egyptians. And all through the Bible, God's people are different. They are holy. Our citizenship is in heaven. And on this earth, we are living as uh, people just passing through. Our, our eternal home is not here on this earth. So while we're on this earth, we're sojourners and exiles. Our home is in heaven. And here on this earth, we are a colony of, of citizens of the kingdom of God. So, it does not matter what uh, ethnic uh, identification you have. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what nationality you are. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. Okay, and, and on this earth, we are living according to the instructions of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me show you two or three other things before we get into an, an identification of the kingdom. <coughs> the kingdom of God depends upon the death of the king. You see, worldly kingdoms depend upon their king surviving and living. But the kingdom of God depends upon the death of its king. A king on this earth will have guards to protect him. Mahaksat 
they will have people to taste the food that they eat. And the king will ride in a bulletproof automobile. And the but Jesus did not have any bodyguards. He wasn't trying to protect his life. Because it was necessary for him to die. In John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said, I lay down my life. No man takes my life. I lay it down. In chapter 19 of John, verse 28, Jesus on the cross said, I'm thirsty. He knew it was finished. And they tried to give Jesus uh, some uh, 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 a sponge full of, of wine. And the Bible says Jesus said it is finished. He voluntarily laid down, bowed his head and said, It is finished. You see, if Jesus had not died, there would not be a kingdom of God. The only way the kingdom of God comes into existence is if the king himself dies. And it's an interesting thing that Pilate uh, wanted to be neutral in this situation. Pilate did not want to crucify him. He wanted to release him. He said, I find no fault in him. And as you remember, he, he uh, said to the people, gave to the people choice. He could, they could choose to release Jesus or choose to release Barabbas, a, a criminal. So Pilate said, let him go. He's not a threat. He has no followers. His own nation has rejected him. He's no threat to Rome. And yet this is the man who, whose kingdom destroyed Rome. The kingdom of God will bring down all the kingdoms of the earth. And as I said, the weapons of the followers of the kingdom of God are not weapons of this earth.
The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, says the Bible. But our weapons, the Bible says, are powerful by God. And that is the preaching of the gospel. Okay, with that in mind, I want us to, to ask the question, what is the kingdom of God? We know Christ himself is the sovereign king. He, he, was, he was coronated in his resurrection. And now he reigns over a kingdom. And we are going to trace that kingdom from the very beginning all through the Bible. But first, let's ask the question, what is the kingdom of God? I want to give you four distinctions about the word kingdom as it's used in the Bible. Number one, the Bible uses the word kingdom in, in the sense that we use it as one who rules over a territory. Now, when we speak uh, of a kingdom, we think of a, a, a realm, a uh, certain territory you can locate on a map. In other words, we're thinking of a kingdom like the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom. We're thinking of a geographical area with, with people and buildings and so on. In other words, the kingdom is that over which the king reigns. And the Bible uses the word in that sense, like it speaks of the kingdom of Israel. But in the kingdom of God, the emphasis is on the reign, the rule, the sovereign rulership of God. And the It's very important that you understand this feature of the kingdom of God. It's the sovereignty of God. Now, a, a second thing I want to, uh, to talk about uh, in defining the kingdom of God is uh, uh, the structure of the kingdom. Now, in my country, we don't have a king. In, in, fact, in fact, the last king that the Americans uh, were subject to didn't turn out too well. The last king? The last, last, king. The last king that America had didn't. before the revolution oh, right, okay. Okay. <laughs> didn't turn out so good. Uh, and 
And today you have a king in England. And that king is not the absolute ruler. He's what is called a constitutional monarch. And in other words, he's a figurehead who signs uh, uh, legislation that goes through parliament. In other words, he's the head of the state, but he's not the head of the government. But that's not the way it is in the Bible. In the Bible, if you are the king, you are the supreme ruler. You have absolute authority. And uh, what you say is law. Well, in the kingdom of God, we're not talking about a territorial, uh, 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 geographical piece of land. We are talking about a spiritual realm where people have yielded themselves to the sovereignty of God. And you enter that kingdom by committing yourself in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to show you that we're members of that kingdom, we're citizens of that kingdom right now. And that kingdom will be consummated when the Lord Jesus returns. So let me show you two ways in which God is sovereign. One way is the Bible talks about God is sovereign over all the universe, the physical creation. He's the ruler of everything that is. Exodus 15, 18 says, The Lord will reign forever and ever. All through the Bible, you will see this fact that God is king of everything. And you can look up some of those scriptures from the notes that you have. But there's a second way that uh, this phrase, the kingdom of God, is used. It refers to the rule of God in your life. The Bible repeatedly refers to Jesus as Lord. Lord. 
And that's more than just a title of distinction. It means that Jesus has absolute authority in your life. And that means right now. The, kingdom, the kingdom of God is a present reality. And it will reach its culmination when Jesus returns. And now let me show you very simply the difference. Today, Jesus reigns in the hearts of those who submit themselves to his lordship. But the majority of people in, uh, don't acknowledge his rulership. But someday, all people everywhere will acknowledge his lordship. One day, every knee will bow before Jesus. On the cross, Jesus defeated sin and death. When he rose from the dead, he was the victor over death and hell. But not everybody is submitted to his authority. He has authority over all things. But all things have not yet submitted to him. What I mean is he is Lord of all right now. There is nothing over which he does not have absolute authority. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. 28.18 He said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. But not everybody realizes that. In fact, if you look in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Uh, no, no, chapters 2 and 6. In two chapters, Ephesians chapters 2 and 6. The Bible talks about the devil being the, the God of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. And his, his reign is over the world. And when, when the Bible says that he's the God of this world, it doesn't mean physical creation. It means a world in, in rebellion against God. Today, we divide people into groups. 
We divide them by nationalities. We divide them by race. We we uh, uh, separate them by social standing. We divide them by gender. We, we divide people by age. But in the spiritual realm, there are only two, two divisions. There is the world and there is the kingdom of God. There is Satan, the prince of this world. And there is Jesus Christ, our King. And every person on this earth is in one of those two kingdoms. And people must choose whom they will serve. You either serve the Lord Jesus or you serve Satan. A lot of people, in fact I say most people on this earth live as though they were in control of their destiny. They live as though there, there was no God to whom they must give an account. Most people go through this life uh, without any thought of eternal reality. They, they don't realize that they are going to have to face their eternal destiny. But the Bible says that one day Jesus will come again. And every single person on this earth, every creation, will bow down and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Okay, let's notice a, another thing concerning the kingdom of God. We've talked about the fact that God is the, the ruler of all the universe. I mean, whether or not people recognize God, God is still sovereign over everything. In fact, in places like the 145th Psalm, verse 1, Psalm 145, verse 1, it calls God the King. So, in that sense, God is the ruler of everything. So, Psalm 135, Psalm 145, verse 1. All right. So, there is God as ruler of everything. But the kingdom of God is God's sovereignty uh, in the lives and hearts of people who submit to Jesus Christ. 
đại cướp con bắt đòi ở tập tài phiệp từ nông đại chết nè đại cho cho nông trường. And there's only one way to enter that kingdom. Hai miếng phải từ mũi cút đại cho từ căn được gọi là bàn. And you see it in John chapter three. Verses 3 and 5. Unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So some people are in the kingdom and some are not. So everybody is under God's sovereignty in the sense that he is ruler over everything. But not everybody is under God's sovereignty in his kingdom. That is, that they have actually entered into the kingdom of God through submission to the Lordship of Jesus. ដល់ថាបតៃភាពរបស់ព្រះជាម្ចាស់នោះដែរហើយគ្រប់គ្នាដែលអាចចូលទៅក្នុងនគររបស់ព្រះបានគឺត្រូវតែចោះចូលទា
Okay, one other thing I want to point out to you. That the kingdom of God came with the coming of Jesus. The first word he spoke when uh, publicly he said uh, the kingdom of God is here. And God, God has initiated His kingdom on earth with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are in that kingdom right now. But it will be consummated when the Lord returns and there will be a separation between those in the kingdom and those not in the kingdom. Alright, and the last thing I want to bring to you in this session is to go to Romans chapter 14 verse 17. This is the only place in the book of Romans 4 17. All right. Let's notice what he means by the kingdom of God. Chapter 14, verse 17. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy of the Holy Spirit. First, he means the reign of God, not the realm of God. As I said, we tend to think of a kingdom as a, a place. No, it's the rule of God in our lives. All right, the kingdom of God refers to his total providence in all things, over all things. It is his, his saving grace in our lives. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught us to pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done. He said, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, God's will is done in heaven. The angels rejoice. But, but on earth, there are those who resist the will of God. But the kingdom of God is that area where his will is perfectly done. And I emphasize again, the kingdom of God is here now, but it will be consummated, fulfilled at the coming of the Lord Jesus. Sometimes people ask the question, 
uh, are the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ the same? Yes, they are. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Ephesians 5, 5 talks about the kingdom of Christ and of God. There's only one kingdom. Alright, look at Romans again at Romans chapter uh, uh, 14 verse 17. He says the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking and it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? Look at the word righteousness. The word righteousness has, it has two meanings. It has the uh, reference to the righteousness that God imputes to us uh, when we come to Him in faith. That's Romans chapter 4, verse 5. And it also means the righteousness that he begins to work in us once we come to him. You'll find this in Romans chapter 6. And specifically verse 13. Romans chapter 6 verse 13 and 16 well just Romans chapter 6 13 through 20 yeah Romans 6 okay all right the kingdom of God is righteousness. What does that mean? Number one, when you came to Jesus Christ in faith, God said you're justified. The, the word justified and righteous are the same word. So God confers righteousness upon you. But he puts the Holy Spirit within us. And the Holy Spirit begins to work in us, transferring, transforming us into the righteousness of Jesus. Now at this point, I want to, uh, to make a statement that I hope you will remember. What is God's purpose for you? Why did God save you? And the, the most common answer is, God saved me so I'd go to heaven. Well, that's true, but heaven is not the reason God saved you. God, see, heaven is just a bonus. But God saved you for life on this earth right now. All of you know Romans chapter 8 verse 
which says that God works all things together for good to those who love him. But look at verse 29. And verse 29 begins with, with the uh, word for, meaning because. Uh, he, he said we are to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ in other words, God's purpose in saving you is to transform you into the likeness of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is within you. And He's producing His fruit in you. And if you look at the fruit that's described in Galatians chapter 5, you'll see that every one of those things is a quality of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is Christ-likeness. It is, it is being like Jesus. Uh, I want you to look also at 2 Corinthians Chapter uh, 3, verse 18. In this verse, chapter Second uh, Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 18. There we're told that we are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. He said the Holy Spirit is transforming us. He's changing us. And that word that's used for transforming us is the very same word that is used for the transfiguration of Jesus. You remember upon the mountain Jesus was transfigured. There was an outward uh, showing demonstration of his glory. You are being transfigured into the likeness of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. So this is why God saved you, so that you would be like Jesus. And, and this is what the kingdom of God is. Um, let's come back to Romans chapter 14, verse 17. And look at the word peace. In the Bible, in the, Bible the word peace has two connotations. First, it means the peace that we have with God. The Bible says that before we came to Christ, we were enemies of God. We were in rebellion against God. But now, in, Rome, uh, in Romans chapter 5, verse 
We have peace with God. The second way the word peace is made is described is that we are at peace with each other. And you'll see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, chapter 13, verse 11. Okay, God, God's kingdom is that place where we have perfect peace with him and we have peace with one another. And so let's come back to Romans chapter 14 verse 17 and put all of these things together. And alongside uh, Romans chapter 14 verse 17 I want you to put another scripture and let's look at Romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 so let's put those two together we have been justified by faith that is, we've been declared righteous. And we have peace with God. And then in verse 2 of Romans 5, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So what do we have in Romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2? We have righteousness, peace and joy. So there is righteousness imputed uh, 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 through faith. Peace with God and joy in the hope of his glory. And that's what the kingdom of God is. In uh, Romans 14, 17, peace, righteousness, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in advancing the, uh, the gospel are the same thing. Uh, over in Matthew chapter 12, you remember when um, they accused Jesus of casting out demons by the, by the power of Satan? Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 verse 28. He said, if, if it's by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So the work of the Spirit of God is the presence of the kingdom of God. Or it's the reign of God exercised through His Spirit. So the Spirit of God creates righteousness and peace and joy. And um, 
Here is a definition of the kingdom of God, which we will work out and we will uh, discuss in the coming sessions. And in our next session, we'll go back to the very beginning uh, and, and of the kingdom of God and we'll show how God worked it out in the history of Israel.